Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, good to see you again. Uh, as the partners and creators of Celebrating Act 2 discuss the world's most important subjects. Actually, today we do have a pretty important topic. Uh, Art, last week we were talking about whether to open up the schools or not. That's uh, Here we are uh, approaching the, uh, the traditional opening school date, and the big question on everybody's mind is, should we open the schools or not? Should we have in-person learning or distance learning? And uh, we differed on that subject, and we said we would uh, continue the discussion today. So have you got anything new for me? Well, the, the first thing I have is because you tend to forget important things is to everybody out there, please go to, if you haven't already done it, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, we want to get our subscriber base up and uh, attract uh, sponsors and other things so that it makes you happy that we're doing well. And that is much more important than anything we could do for COVID-19. Let's face well, it, any, any, subscribers. And any information we give you is strictly our opinion. And generally speaking, I'm more right than John is. But no, no, he's more right than no, I am. No, I'm more right you're <laughs> yeah. more left. So go ahead, John. Why don't you, uh, why don't you provoke me? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Art. It's always a pleasure to do that, by the way. I know. Um, well, here's my big premise and my big problem with the, uh, the fear that fear mongering that is going around that is preventing schools from opening. I, it, it, of course, this has all become political and it shouldn't have, but the fear mongering is that, oh my God, we're all going to catch COVID-19 and die. All right. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but there's a couple of interesting things that have happened recently. First of all, we know that over these six months of COVID-19, we learn something new every week. There's another opinion coming out. Um, it changes. We've learned stuff over the, over the months that we didn't know in the beginning. One of the things that happened recently is the American, um, I'll probably get this wrong, the AAP, American Association of Pediatrics, something like that, has said that um, in-person learning is really, really important for kids. And they listed a whole host of reasons what you get out of going to school besides the education. Um, let me let me look at something. I might even have that for you, well, you got here. A, you got a cheat sheet there? You've actually, I got a cheat sheet. You're actually real research? I got a cheat sheet. So mm -hmm. it, it just listed it. Well, it provides well-being well and provides our children and as adolescents with not only academic instruction, social and emotional skills, safety, reliable nutrition, physical speech, mental health therapy, opportunities for physical activity. And then it goes on to say it even plays a critical role in addressing racial and social inequality, inequity. Um, so the, the main point here is taking this at, at general value is that there is great value in sending kids back to school. And yes, no, I don't think anybody disagrees that it's got to be done safely. But the argument you were making last week was that, oh, my God, what do we do about those teachers? And what do we do about the staff? And what do we do about the something or other? Because we know over these last six months or so that the kids, the children, are not that susceptible. The people that are not only more susceptible – to COVID-19, but the people that are more likely to really be injured, be negatively affected, are people over 60. Um, and in fact, I got some more stats for you if I can find them. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, maybe I didn't write them down. Okay, so here it is. Laboratory, it, I did some, you wanted me to go to John Hopkins. I didn't go to John Hopkins, but I did research these numbers. As of May, because you, you last week you mentioned... Okay, it's July 20th today, but go ahead, as of May yeah. what? Well, I mean, these are the statistics. You mentioned last week we're getting more cases. And I said cases are a, an irrelevant number. The number of cases changes with the number of tests you do, 
right? You do more tests, you're going to find more cases. You're on a roll. Just keep going. What I'm <laughs> interested in mm -hmm. is a relevant number of how many of those new cases are negative, how many are positive, and does the ratio change? So if we have, if we test a thousand people and have one percent uh, infection rate, but we test a million people and still have a one percent infection rate, that's a meaningful number because now I know whether the ratio, the percentages change. So percentages is what I, what I looked up. As of May 30th uh, of this year, 2020, laboratory confirmed cases. These are, let me make this official and do my British accent. Laboratory confirmed cases as of May 30th. Get this, people under nine years old uh, 51 people per thousand, per hundred thousand. Under 19, that is from 10 years to 19, 20 years, 117 people per 100,000. It jumps from low, low um, percentage under 20 to at 29, between 20 and 29 years. In other words, those people in their 20s, it jumps from 117 at most to 400. So it quadruples over the age of 20. Now get this, in the 40s and 50s, it goes from basically the 400 per 100,000 to 550 in your 40s and 50s. In your 60s and 70s, the infection percentage, the infection rate, if you will, actually lowers about 50, 75 from 450 from 550 in your 60s and 70s, 550 cases per 100,000 to about 475 per 100,000. Here's the big important number. When Fine, you hit finally, 80, finally. When you hit 80 and up, mm -hmm. it jumps from 450 or 475 to 900 cases per 100,000. So According to that chart, again, laboratory confirmed cases, positive cases of COVID-19 as of May 30th, according to that chart, it's only really the people 80 and up. Now, it doesn't, this doesn't account for underlying conditions, doesn't account for, you know, a 10-year-old on a, on a compressor and an and a iron lung who might get it. it it's, this is the general numbers. Okay, okay. But 80 and up, 80 and up is really the classic high category, high high susceptibility rate of 902 cases per 100,000. Now, if my math is correct, that is about 1%, 900 out of 100,000. Okay, so, so John, uh, hopefully your spleen is uh, sufficiently depleted now. Uh, yeah. In the last, you don't even realize it because you're so enthusiastic about making all these points and having research and so on and so forth. Yes. Uh, so you've been going on for about five and a half minutes. Yes. Okay. And one thing I haven't heard you talk about is should schools reopen? You may be trying to get there, but so hang in there for well, a moment. You hang, hang, in, hang in there for a moment. Hang in there okay. for a moment. Okay. This is your five minutes. Okay. This is my five minutes and I hope to take far less than that. Uh, and... I like how you, you constantly jumped around with numbers here and there. totally irrelevant to the school situation, but I'm going to do you the favor of also uh, digressing for a moment. Do you like M&Ms? Sure. Sure. So if I gave you 100 M&Ms in a jar, they were all sufficiently mixed. And right. since the death rate is around 2%, say that two of those M&Ms are poison. Okay. How likely are, maybe you would, test some but how likely if you knew that one of the two of those hundred were poison and you couldn't possibly tell the difference of which ones were you might not actually eat any of them can i answer that no not yet okay not yet okay because it it's a, almost as nonsensical as some of the stuff you brought so let's get to why why the school situation should be in general any place that has an increase and a lot of uh, 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 infections happening is a danger spot in the U.S. And, and there are a few states in the 
primarily in the Northeast, who took serious uh, measures early on and now have a very low infection rate. I mean, not only rate, but physical numbers, not even low percentage, <clears throat> but physical numbers of people getting infected. And here's the problem with reopening schools. If you open up schools, it's likely that even though, and forgetting about the fact that even if younger people get it, like in the 20s or even in, in the teens get it, they are, a good percentage of them are likely to have serious health issues in, in, in pulmonary issues and things like that going to the future. But forgetting about that for a moment, that they will survive and that they will probably be generally okay. The problem with reopening in school is that you have teachers and uh, cafeteria workers and the people driving buses and uh, the maintenance staff and all and the office staff and all the uh, important people to keep that infrastructure going by having classes live what you and and kids don't stay away from each other so if anybody gets it it's going to get around that it's bad enough that you have it there. So if all the teachers have PPEs and everybody else in school, maybe even N95 masks to, for maximum protection, okay? The kids coming home, a certain number of them, are going to be spreading disease to parents and grandparents and other kids, okay? And that's where the real danger exists, is you have people inadvertently, all well-meaning, Spreading. So when you have things like Arizona, and Texas, <clears throat> particularly Southern California, but throughout California, that had it under control for a while and then reopened and people started walking around without masks and, and, and congregating in, in, in restaurants and high densities. And now you can see that the numbers have gone way up. Where they haven't gone up is the places that have had uh, mandatory masks, where they've had uh, uh, social distancing where they haven't had people meeting in large groups and things like that. So that's coming down. So some of those areas may be a, a bit open. And for instance, we both live in California. There are some counties in the far uh, north of California that probably had little to no COVID exposure. Those places are probably going to be fine. But any place where it's so rampant, um, uh, you just can't afford to do it yet. My opinion now. Uh, Little League in Orange County, they reinstituted it. Lots of people signed up. First weekend, they came together for practice. They found out they tested, and one team, uh, some of the adults and some of the kids, tested positive for COVID. It's over. They've shut it down. I don't know what's happening in San Diego, but uh, they've shut down Little League, which they meant well. Look, it would be great to have the kids out there playing, but what would happen? It would get transmitted and people would bring it home and give it to their parents, give it to grandparents, and that would just increase the spread. I will tell you further that I served nine years on a school board back east, both K to, uh, uh, K to six elementary and then uh, high schools uh, as a separate district, but I served on both boards uh, as an elected uh, position and I was there for nine years. I, ran through three elections, so I was pretty well versed in what was going on and with special ed kids and, and lots of other things. There is no way with the kind of rates that we have here in Southern California, I would ever vote to reopen it now. The only arguments that I see that it's really forcing this, and, and it's primarily political, and it's a huge problem, there's no question about it, is Part of the reasons to open up school, and a lot of people are pushing it, is that <clears throat> the kids have some place to be so the parents can go back to work because not everybody can work from home. And it's a significant problem. And that is what I think is causing too many people to say, well, the kids will be okay. The kids will probably be generally okay, but the risk to the staff members and to the kids coming home being exposed to lots of other kids, it's going to get around and people are going to get sick and people are going to be sick and have permanent disabilities from it. And a lot of people, I would say the vast majority of people, will probably 
recover. Where, where, do, where do you get this? They're going to have permanent disability from. I have not heard anybody okay. talk about any disability after you've had it. So th this is why I suggested. I mean, the big problem is death. This is, if you survive it, well, no, that's that. No, that's a problem. Then you don't have a long term uh, ongoing disability. That's okay. True. I'm going to suggest once again that you go yeah. to Johns Hopkins, and it will talk. There, there is so much information up there, and they basically, with all the the nonsense of the saying, well, well, the CDC doesn't have it right, and the NIH doesn't have it right, and and now, by the way, a, a, a part of what you can see because they want schools and things to reopen again is that cer certain states are beginning to hide information; they're not reporting it. Florida has been doing it now for about two or three weeks. We have friends who live in Florida; they're outraged. Okay, you want to know how. Not just which hospitals are full, you're getting that because the individual hospitals are talking about it. They're not reporting the data up so that people can see, is it spreading or not spreading, okay? They want to hide the information so that people would reopen because they think that if it reopens, the economy is going to get better. The problem is going to be is that if you reopen, whether it be schools, whether it be uh, in, in restaurant dining inside, whether it be uh, uh, religious services, whatever they are, where people are un unmasked, especially unmasked, wear a damn mask, okay? I mean, if everybody wore a mask, that would probably obviate most of the system. Go to Johns Hopkins, okay? And it's not like, well, do people get sick or not? Yes, and the, all the information is there. These are people relating the information. So here's the bottom line for me. Okay. Okay, if you open up the schools now, Five minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, actually, it's about six minutes. <laughs> um, so, bottom line. For you. Bottom line is that uh, uh, we, we we need the schools open eventually because you need a place to have kids, so that parents can go back to work because not everybody can work from home, and I think that's a, a driving factor. Yes, kids belong in school. There's going to be the kids going to get um, uh, some kids are going to be uh, uh, hurt by not having that in class experience. But all of us are going to be worse hurt in the short term. And if everybody wore a mask and we get it under control, then maybe six months from now, people can go back. Go to Johns Hopkins and actually read the data as opposed to cherry picking some, some Art. information you have. Art. But anyway, John, it's Very good to well see said. you. Good, good argument. Very well said. But, good argument. Here's, but, here's, here's my bottom line. Yeah. My bottom line is that... Uh, Number one, we have to get back to a normal society. Yes. Well, we both we agree, don't disagree. We agree that. We don't disagree that we have to do it safely. What we disagree upon is how safe do we have to be. When your side of the aisle says we need to keep everything closed down, my answer is we did that for three months. And when you open up, Everywhere, anywhere, after three months of uh, the whole country pretty much locked down as much as people are going to lock down, it spread again. So every time you lock down, it's going to, and you open up, it's going to spread again. This is a vicious cycle because you can't kill it by the lockdown. You can't kill it by, by this kind of isolation. And here's, here's where I'm going with this. I've said it before, and this is the argument against what I call the fear-mongering of we have to shut down, my God, people will die. It's a virus. Some people will die. But we now know who those people are. According to the statistics, the statistics I read, they're pretty much over 80. Well, I will, I will say over 60. But they're not the kids, and they're not the parents. They're people over 60. They're the retired people. They're you and me and the greatest generation over 80. They're the ones who really need to be isolated and they need to be protected. You don't protect the great masses who don't need protection by shutting them all down. You don't protect those few, let's say over 60, that need the protection by shutting the whole society down. That's the, mis the, the bad logic of this argument of closing schools. Now, that's not to say that we should open schools willy-nilly and don't wear face masks, don't take protection, 
don't consider people's health. Uh, and it is also not to say that different districts are going to do it differently for whatever their reasons. They get to choose what they – school districts are a local thing. They're not a national thing. They're not even a statewide thing. School districts, as you know, because you're on two different boards, are pretty much run locally, countywide typically. So school districts, every individual county or school district can make their own decision. People get to vote for school district people like you. They get to choose. That's what this society is all about. If your town wants to shut down the schools and my town wants to open them up, whatever the reasons, that's fine because that's the way it should be. So I'm going to take a brief rebuttal, okay? Okay. And then you can have a brief rebuttal and I'll have a re-rebuttal and then we're going to end this. I love you, John. Oh, please. Please end this. The viewers have already left. All right. It's now you and me. School boards can figure out how they want to do things locally, but you need in some cases, national and certainly statewide uh, standards. You come from New York originally, and they had uh, regents exams, and you had to pass certain things in order to graduate from high school. That wasn't set up by local district. That was set up by the state. That was set up by a, a higher authority, if you will, in education, because most of the locals have limited information and limited value, and most virtually all school board members are, are just parents, and they don't have the educational background. So... Uh, you do need standards. Number two, and again, go to Johns Hopkins. There are plenty of doctors who have said, and they've been saying this all along. You've heard it. You may have dismissed it. Okay. Forget about the impracticality of it. But if everybody were, were locked at home, which is impractical, and wore a face mask for four months, this whole thing would be gone. And they have certain uh, uh, instances where they can show in certain countries, which, which already have to take a look at Japan, take a look at Korea, Take a look at places that wear, fa- fa- wear face masks in the first place. And then in China, even when they got a recurrence in Beijing, I think, recently, they shut down key areas just to get it t- to the point where it doesn't spread anymore. But they wear masks. So in any event, there is a way to control it. Not just my opinion. Go take a look. There are a number of sites out there. And quite frankly... What does it hurt to wear a mask? Okay, it really doesn't. But we're not we're not arguing uh, about no, masks. Um, we're Ar- arguing about I, getting my, back to school. My argument so, my argument is not about wearing masks. It's about shutting so down my schools. Next to last thing is that I thank yes. you for pointing out to our audience that on my side of the aisle, my side of the aisle is the sanity side. I love that. Okay, I love so, that. Uh, I've been holding so on that for even... about three minutes. So uh, I'm not saying that your side is the insanity. Yes. Side. Okay, because uh, there are too many things that you are saying about. Okay, but just to argue to open up the schools and it's a local thing, it's not local. It spreads. It's like it doesn't stop at the school district line. Okay, because teachers and staff uh, live different places and you kind of all going to die. And, I know. No. Teachers and, and bus drivers and everybody. And then they bring it home and everybody will die and we need to close down the schools. Why? Because the schools are festering with COVID-19. Oh, my God, we can't allow anybody to get sick. Well, you know what is really great about this conversation what? is that uh, one of my uh, 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 a friend of mine that I used to work with here who lives in Australia uh, commented uh, to me. He says, finally, OK, we had a good discussion. This is talking about our last week uh, yeah. and, and had both sides. OK, and uh, I know where he fell down, but it doesn't really matter on what what side of the aisle. OK, that my very sane friend fell down on. I don't need to mention that here, but uh, uh, maybe uh, if people will subscribe to Celebrating Act 2 at YouTube, they can not only see us now. Now we're going at it. OK. Uh, because we do have different opinions. Uh, but uh, the bottom line of it all is we want everybody to be safe. We want the economy to we reopen. Do. And we have different ways of approaching it. The fact we that do. yours is illogical and mine is sane, uh, by your own admission, that I'm on the same <laughs> side. Uh, you're on the illogical side of the aisle, uh, is okay. But uh, we do have different opinions, and I do respect them. And we, I have friends who are not as open to ideas as you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm the troglodyte, but I must be open to ideas. Nice hey, you're too kind. word. 
Let my th so I get the last word after you've done the goodbye. Well, no, right? it wasn't troglodyte. You're the last yeah. word. Yeah. So uh, the idea of of shutting everything down, you constantly go from shutting down or not shutting down to wearing masks. There's a way to keep them open, which includes everybody wearing masks, which includes changing schedules, which change maybe be mixing up the days of the week. There's all kinds of techniques that people are talking about in order to open up the schools. And by the way, it's not just a, 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 um, an economic people need to get back to work, parents need to have a place to dump their kids argument. Where I started was the American Association of Pediatrics, uh, Pediatricians. And they said, without arguing that we should open all the schools, they said, look, there's more value to having kids in school than just learning. They didn't even address the value, the economic value of having a place to put the kids so parents can go whack, back to work. They addressed all those psychological values and benefits to uh, in-person education. So I don't think anybody's arguing, your side isn't arguing, my side isn't arguing, that in-person education is not important. We're only arguing how to solve the COVID problem. And locking everything down for another four months, as you say, if we, if we locked everything down and wore masks for four months, we'd solve this. And the answer four is weeks. no. You, four weeks. No, no, the answer is you won't. We did that. Been there, done that. The whole country shut down for three months. New York did. Oh, New York is so, they're so perfect. New York is the place that it is. You're they, from took New all York. The, they took all the old cases, the COVID cases, and put them in the nursing homes with the people who were really vulnerable. Please don't, don't hold New York up. So I think it's time for us to let everybody rest. Say goodbye, okay. John. And we could do... We could do <laughs> say goodnight, Gracie. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe we'll we'll pick up uh, if we can find anything controversial to talk about. Then maybe we well, we, we ought to do that. Uh, I know we ought to know, find something controversial if we can. instead of this stuff where we agree on everything. Right. Anyway, uh, John, do you want to uh, uh, walk us out of this thing and remind people to subscribe, or is that I, my I job? I want to remind people to subscribe to Celebrating Act Two, and I want to remind them to. Uh, like hit the like what is it the thumbs up thing for yeah. this video that we like we like to get all those thumbs up that's good uh, but more importantly I think we need them to tell their friends about celebrating act two and how one guy is always right that's me that's me that's me and the other guy is always wrong that's you that's you that's you that's you You're pretty good at uh, that. <laughs> and you know what please send people, a, if you have an opinion that that the people who should be protected from COVID-19 are the people who are most susceptible and the people who will get hurt the most. And that's the people over 60 and arguably maybe even over 80. And the kids and the adults working in school, if there's anybody in that group working in school, they should be protected. But the kids and the parents and the teachers, they should take reasonable precautions while they're back in school. Reasonable precautions includes all kinds of things, but it doesn't include shutting the schools down for another bunch of months. Okay, let's, let's see if we can finish off on something that we agree on, okay? okay. Uh, even with, if we're reluctant, okay, there's no reason why anybody who goes outside and is with anybody else shouldn't be wearing a mask. Uh, we agree on that 100%. Good. So. Once again, once again, we come to common ground. Anyway, Art, Art, you are such a conciliator. Is that the right word? Or a con a well, that's a mafia term. Consigliori. Yeah. No, that's a different. That's it. <laughs> but not a troglodyte or whatever that is. I have to look that up when I'm finished. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you for visiting us. Please let us know how you feel. Yes. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Give us some feedback. Yeah. Tell Art how wrong he is. Yeah. Please <laughs> do that. All right. Thanks. All right. See you soon. See you, John. Be well. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.